the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegand, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heika when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heika? Thus, the village of Centerville became Heika. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Heika. Two miles west of Heika, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heika and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Rover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heika, St. Wendell and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. I'm Charlie Bauer, and today is October 10th, 2005, and this is the gathering of the Greater Centerville Historians, and tonight's topic is going to be the Cleveland State Bank, and I'm sitting in for Kathy Sixel tonight, and Kathy Sixel's got some family doings out in Minnesota, so you have to put up with me tonight, and uh, some of the rules, where I'm going to go over the rules is, if you have something to offer to the topic, raise your hands. And when the camera is on, no talking because the camera will pick up the background noise. And uh, always introduce yourself when you have something to offer. So when somebody looks at the tape, they know who's talking. And refrain from using people's nicknames like Lefty or Butch or Shorty. Always refer to somebody by their proper name so 100 years from now they know who you're talking about. Um, and I think the next thing here that I would like to mention is if you get the Manitowoc paper, the Nenning Dance Hall is completed and they got their big doings coming up this weekend. They got a dance from 7 to 10 o'clock. And it will pass this around probably. And one other thing, if we have any photographs, once the cameraman gets done photographing them, if you would just pass them around so everybody can get a, a chance to look at them, but, but wait until the camera gets them videotaped. Okay, Charlie, a question pertaining to the Nenning Dance Hall. Where is it now located? The, the dance hall got moved to the Pinecrest Historic Village. Okay. And it's been re-venerated, cleaned, and painted, and all spruced up. Okay. And it looks pretty good. They had a, like a sneak preview about a weekend ago, and okay. I got down to see it. And it's, oh, you did? It's okay. really tip-top shape, yes. And okay. I, I suggest if anybody's got any time, if you can't get there for the dance, at least go Sunday during the day to see it. It's well worth it. Okay. And now the question for tonight. Yes, uh, and this is the videographer, Jerry O'Neill, and we're going to have a little introduction of the folks that have joined us, and we're going to be asking them to identify themselves and maybe where they live, because we've done that before. But the added thing is pertaining to where in the past has a bank helped you? So we'll start over on, with you, Charlie, okay? okay. <laughs> Charlie Bauer from Newton, Highway C. And the only thing that comes to mind is they always cash my paycheck, and I really appreciated that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Charlie. I'll, I'll cut right here. Okay, I've got a lady here who uh, will introduce herself and tell us where she lives and how a bank has helped her. Marie Pippert. I live in Cleveland. What do you mean, how the bank helped me? Yes. Uh, did, <laughs> did you buy that new Cadillac or something with no. the loan or anything? I just remember the first one, and there was all my relation in there. So they would often ask what I, what I was going to do when I drew out money. And then when they retired, then I got some more relations, like Charlie Culp and <laughs> all of them. <laughs> so you had relatives to work with, right? Yep, right. Yep. Very good, very mm -hmm. good. And who do you have here, please? Kathy Wagner. Hi, Kathy. And I'm at 334 East Washington Avenue in Cleveland. Okay. And the uh, bank, I always thought it was a very nice place to go to. And in my all my years as a village clerk, I spent a lot of time walking up to the bank and okay. depositing money. Very good. That's a way to do it, depositing. Deposit. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. it wasn't my money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That's right. Very good. Thank you. 
Okay, we have a gentleman here who would like to introduce himself and where he lives and go on from there. I'm Walter Kress. I live at 350 East Washington. And I remember the bank in 1937. I went up there and paid my quarter and I got my driver's license from Clarence Witt. No kidding. <laughs> Wonderful. Nice thought. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I've got a young lady here who would like to uh, introduce herself and give us some information. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Cindy Hoon. I've lived in the village for the last 30 years, and I've been fortunate to be employed for the last 29 at Cleveland State Bank. Wow. Uh, probably been a big part of my life as far as providing employment, and yet uh, making the dreams of home ownership come true a few times, and okay. vehicles, and all the fun things play for. Sure. Now, you say you lived here 29 years. Uh, where did you come from? Um, I was raised closer to Sheboygan. Okay. Uh, my husband was raised west of the village of Cleveland, and when we married, we settled in the village and hmm. have never left. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And who do you have here, please? I'm Charlie Cole. <clears throat> I live at 13324 Highway 42 Newton. And how has the bank been important to me? Uh, in 1971, I was looking at... Uh, changing jobs and I used Mr. Whitty as a reference and he asked me uh, after he got an inquiry if I was looking at changing jobs and I said yeah and he said, asked me if I was ever interested in banking and that's pretty much how I ended up working at the bank for 31 years. Isn't that something? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. And we have a gentleman here and he'd like to introduce himself. Go right ahead please. I'm Melvin Yenich and I moved into the village in 1963 and I bought my house from Clarence Witt and they financed me to be at the bank. Wonderful. Very good. Thank you very much. And who do you have here, please? Ken Brooks from 1030 Elm Street. And when we bought our house, we went to the Cleveland Bank through Clarence Whitty, and we got our loan through Clarence Whitty. Okay. Very good. And who do you have here, please? Hi, I'm Judy Brookshin. I also live on Elm Street. I guess the bank was always there for us when we needed to buy toys and cars and okay. education and yeah. multiple money you needed. Very good. Thank you very much. And we have another lady here who would like to say a few words. Go right ahead, please. I'm Alice Mathias. I uh, live on Juniper Street, and I also was fortunate to work at the bank. Oh, okay. The way I got hired one day, uh, Herb Lorfold came knocking at my back door, and he asked if I'd be interested in part-time work. He said Clarence Witt liked, Witty liked the way I made out my deposit slips. Okay. So anyhow, <laughs> I took that part-time job, and when Charlie started in 1971, I think in 1972 I went full-time, and I worked full-time like for till uh, 88, I believe, 87, wow. whatever. Wow. I worked full-time. I think it was, <laughs> I forget, 16 years maybe full-time. Wonderful. Isn't that something how it started and blossomed mm -hmm. from there, huh? Mm -hmm. And it was a good place to work. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you very much. And. We have a gentleman here who will identify himself. I'm Willard Matthias, who live in 1018 Juniper Street. Uh, I remember my dad gave me $500 when I was a kid, I was a year old, and I put, he put that in the bank, 1% mm -hmm. interest, and when I come out of the service, 21 years old, I thought, boy, I should have a pile there, you know? <laughs> and I had $650 at the bank <laughs> after all these 20 years of in deposit. And I, I guess right now it isn't much better yet. Right. <laughs> but uh, I, I figured I'd have a, enough money to buy a car, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had to p get a little bit beside that. But anyway, we bought our first house, our men, our house, yeah. and I had to borrow the money there too. Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, very good. Anything else? You were just about ready to say something there. Well, I said it was a good place to do business with. I never had no problems with them. Great. Super. Okay, we got another lady here who'd like to say a few words. Go right ahead, please. I'm Irene Dine. I live on 915 Port Lane. And uh, I guess I just knew the bank was there for everyday living. Very good. Very good. And I, myself, Jerry O'Neill, I didn't have the honor of doing business at the Cleveland Bank. I was more around the Newton area, so Newton was my uh, place where I borrowed money and so forth, and I was fortunate enough to buy a few <laughs> shares of stock, and it went well. <laughs> so I appreciated it all, too. Okay, Charlie, uh, I guess we'd like to start out with our subject matter, and uh, maybe you can show us the card that was sent I, out. I was going to, at the camera, take a look at the postcard here, and then we're going to have to give this postcard to somebody from Cleveland that can explain it to the camera, because okay. I can't. <laughs> 
you got an arrow pointing to a building. Right, and I was told that was probably the first building that the Cleveland State Bank was in, and okay. we're going to get somebody to document that for us. Okay, very good. I'll cut right here. Thank you. Okay, I've got a young lady here who uh, has some uh, documents in front of her, and she'd like to identify herself and provide some information. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Cindy Hoon, uh, Vice President of Cleveland State Bank. Uh, going back in the old minutes, there was a meeting held on May 15th of 1907, um, in regard to the picture, and it said, Resolved to rent a banking office from William Bailitz on lot, 13, lot 12 and 13, known as his old saloon, for $50 a year was carried. Was further respond to leave it to William Bremen uh, to buy a secondhand safe, but if he could not find anything suitable by June 1st, 1907, to buy a new one at his best judgment as well as a bank counter, which was carried. Okay. Now this so, was like a stockholders meeting or some kind of a meeting? Uh, just was a special meeting. That's all it, okay. all it states, and it was signed by the board of directors. Okay. Is there uh, names that are written there for you? William Bailitz, okay. William Bruman, F. A. Kielsman, Otto Klesik, Adolf Stoltenberg, and J. D. Schneider. Okay. And again, the year that that document was written, please. N May fifteenth, nineteen o seven. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we got a young lady with some information she'd like to uh, bring about, and uh, she'll identify herself. Go right ahead, please. Cindy Hoon, Cleveland State Bank, uh, Vice President and Cashier. Uh, the bank originally received its state banking charter on April 19th okay. of 1907. Okay, can you tip that forward just a little bit? There we go. And if I could ask you, can you read part of that charter also? Um, to all to whom presents shall come. Cleveland, or whereas by an examination of the Cleveland State Bank, located Cleveland, <coughs> County of Manitowoc, State of Wisconsin, the undersigned has ascertained that the capital stock of $15,000 required by its articles of incorporation has been paid in full and that the said banking operation has in all respects compiled with the provisions of an act of the legislature of the state of Wisconsin entitled an act for the creation of bank and for the regulation and supervision of the banking business approved May 13th, 1903 in all acts um, mandatory thereafter. Now therefore in presence of law, I Marcus C. Berg, Commissioner of Banking of the State of Wisconsin do issue the certificate of authority to the above named bank to commence the bu business of banking as defined in said act in testimony dated April or uh, April 19th 1907 okay and I thank you for that and the identification of that bank again was like Cleveland, Cleveland State, State bank. bank correct okay that's correct uh, the minutes from the first stockholders meeting were dated May 1st, 1907. Okay. A meeting for the purpose of organizing a state bank for the village of Cleveland was held in the evening, May 1st, 1907, at August Erdman's Hall. Will William F. Bruman was elected president and William Bailett secretary of said meeting. After the banking business was fully explained and discussed, the members present began their subscription for the necessary $15,000 of capital stock, which had been signed by 14 members of said stockholders on the Articles of Incorporation on April 19, 1907. Said articles had been approved by Commissioner of Banking on April 24, 1907, and duly recorded on April 26, 1907. The further proceedings under date of this meeting were the election of seven directors having been moved and seconded that the first vote taken should be declared illegal. The directors of the Cleveland State Bank were elected by ballot and resulted in the following members to wit. William Bailitz, Joseph D. Schneider, William F. Bruman, F. A. Kielsmeyer, Otto Klesik, John Lorfeld, and A. Stoltenberg. After the directors had signed the oath, they proceeded to elect a president from out of their members, which out of their members which lot was fallen upon William Bailitz and for Vice President F. A. Kielsmeyer was elected. The directors appointed William F. Bruman assistant cashier for the 
assuming fiscal year. The bylaws were adopted by the stockholders and signed by the president and cashier, the latter, Joseph D. Schneider, being appointed at the close of the meeting. The loan committee is made up of the following directors, A. Stoltenberg, William Bailitz, and Joseph D. Schneider. The examining committee is made up of the following directors to wit, John Larfelt, Otto Klesik, and F. A. Kielsmeyer. It was further resolved to leave it to the directors to make arrangements for the location of the banking office. Should it be impossible to rent a suitable building for that purpose, then a special meeting of the stockholders shall be called to decide on the same. It was left to the assistant cashier to buy furniture, fixtures, and printing. William Bailett, secretary. William F. Bruman, president. Very good. Very good. Very good. I'm glad that document has been kept all these years. It's over 100 years Not old. Not quite. Close. Not quite. Getting close. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got uh, a gentleman here who has been good enough to join us this evening, and he'd like to indicate, uh, again, his name and maybe some positions that he's held and then go on to other information. I'm Charles Cole, and I'm past president of the Cleveland State Bank. This is a photograph of the uh, Erdman Hall where the original meeting okay. was held to establish the Cleveland State Bank. Okay, you can just hold it just for a moment like that. It looks Subs good. Subsequent to that. Okay, now could you give us the location streetwise of that building? Corner of uh, West Washington and Juniper, I believe. On our corner? Used to be Wimler's Hall. Oh, it's on the I didn't know what. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yes. Before uh, it's where Polly's Palace is yeah. right now. I see. Now that I look at it, yes, it's part of Wimler's Hall. Yeah. And the bank? Was there? No, this yeah. is where they held their first meeting. Oh, their first meeting. I'm sorry. They decided to uh, build a bank. Oh, okay, great. We do know that the uh, first building, or the first office occupied, was in the saloon part of the William Bailitz building. And that was subsequent to that uh, four unit apartment. It was a case dealership, I believe, at one time. And it uh, was destroyed by fire here about a year ago, I guess. It does not exist at this time. Okay. It was in 1911 that the uh, bank board decided to go ahead and build their first building. All right. And that building has a, we have photographs of that. Okay, very good. Okay, let me get this is the same building which is on Hickory Street. Okay. Today it, <clears throat> was housing a laundromat. It's, I believe it's apartments right now. Okay. And this was a completed, it started in 1911 and, and completed in 1911 when they occupied it. Okay. And this was built, built brand new then? That is correct. Okay. No, that looks like a two-story building, if I can see the picture correctly. <coughs> what? I remember as a kid going in there, and <coughs> that bank building, the teller gauges had uh, high walls, and they had <laughs> metal screening in front of the tellers, and I know that Mr. Lorfeld mentioned that they even had a pistol slot <coughs> under the counter just in case they were ever held up. <laughs> Anything else that you'd like to bring about at this point? Not at this point, but I think that Cindy has some information regarding that building. Okay, just one moment. I've got a young lady here again, and uh, she's got some information she'd like to share and also identify herself. Cindy Hoon, Cleveland State Bank. A uh, meeting was held on May 9th of 1910. We go, motion made by M.G. Daman, seconded by John Lorfeld, that the Board of Directors be authorized to purchase the lot of Charles Mill for a sum not to exceed $100 for the purpose of, of creating a bank building thereon. The first vote by valid on above motion to be formed. Result of vote was 140 authorizing board and 8 against. Motion was made by E.M. Reinert, 
and seconded by John Lorfeld that a uh, vote by formal ballot be taken to authorize the board of directors to have erected on that the lot to be purchased for such purposes a bank building to co to cost not more than twenty eight hundred dollars and that this oh. sum be <laughs> appropriated from our corporation funds to defray the cost of such banking. The results of the vote on above motion was 123 votes in favor of authorizing the board of directors, six votes against, and two scattered. <laughs> so I found that quite interesting. Yes, it's a um, new term. <laughs> we also have the blueprints from the building you do. from then. Okay. So I don't know if those can be. We'll see what we can do there. Be seen or not. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll cut it at this time then. Okay. Okay, I'm looking at the architect's print of the new Cleveland State Bank. And could you, from your distance there, could you give that name one more time? Is it? Uh, William G. Royber. William J. Royber out of Manitowoc. Okay. R E E U B E R. Okay. Well, he's a typical you banker, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, this is <laughs> Mr. Charles Culp has this uh, decal. That's very nice. And we have another one on uh, of a different nature. And uh, you identify yourself one more time, please. Cindy Hoon, Cleveland State Bank. Very good, thank you. Okay, there was a question on the floor, and uh, somebody knows somebody here, so uh, this gentleman will identify himself, please. Melvin Yaney, and... Uh, I remember William Bailitz had a farm somewhere in the vicinity of natural ovens across the road to, on the east side of the could, highway. Could you give us that highway, please, at this a, time? At that time, it was 141. Okay. And now it's called CR, right? Right. Okay. And how many miles from Manitoba would you guess? About four. Okay. And uh, he ended up raising heifers, and we bought a heifer from him once. It was very depression. Okay. And what year that was was probably 1947. Okay. Now, did Mr. Bayless, did he have any other occupations other than involved with the bank? He had the hardware store. Okay. And this was after his son took over the hardware store. And, and where was that store, if I may interrupt, where was that store located on what streets? Hazel. What street again? On the east side of Hazel Street. Okay. Which is right on the east side of the tracks. All right. And uh, I don't remember his son's name, that one, but uh, the other one was also depot agent at one time. The depot agent also? The his son. His yeah. son was, okay. That was Milton. Okay. And the other one was? Wallace. Wallace, Wallace. you're yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Very good, thank you very much, Mel. Okay, I, uh, the videographer had a question pertaining to the name of Bailitz, and maybe there were some relatives in this village, uh, some were in business for other purposes, and maybe the, this gentleman can straighten me out. Go right ahead, please. Melvin Yenich, and uh, the Bailitz hardware store was owned by two brothers, Robert and William. And they also sold lumber at that time, which was around 1928, something like that. And I just found this out last week from Mrs. Tilke that they had sold lumber. And this, uh, afterwards, William, I guess, took over the hardware store, and Robert got into. I don't know what business he was in, but then the boy, his boy uh, and Clarence and 
Gilbert, they got into a feed mill, built a new feed mill. Okay. And this was around 1942. It was shortly before World War II. Okay. And <clears throat> but the other bailiffs was the gentleman that was involved in the bank, is that correct? The senior of the two brothers that were in the hardware store first. Okay. okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay, I'll read a little bit what I see here. We pay a 3% interest on 6 or 12 month certificates. $1 starts a savings account. See us for your loan. This is a postcard that the Cleveland State Bank had. Month on them. Probably every month. Now these are postcards sent out by the bank to their customers, is that correct? That's my assumption. Okay. And these postcards, uh, if I understood correctly, were sort of a monthly thing to be sent out to the customers, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay, we're looking at a document here, and uh, the lady will give us some information about that. Uh, it's a certificate of deposit for Cleveland State Bank with a picture of the building from the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. i got to say that the architecture of that building makes it stand out very nicely, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, any year on that particular? Um, no. Okay. There is not. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with all these beautiful documents kept in such excellent condition, is there somebody that was responsible for this at the bank? I guess I inherited the job. Oh, really? <laughs> I really don't know how, but um, as, yeah, <laughs> twisted my arm. Um, at one time, when not the building that we were talking about, but uh, the building that was built in 1959, a lot of the documents had been kept in the basement and things got somewhat on the mildew side and yeah. uh, when we moved into uh, our present building mm -hmm. then I probably just took it upon myself to put things together where they belonged and so it was really quite easy to go and gather this information uh, so it's preserved in the vault some in the safe deposit box and uh, when we celebrated our 75th anniversary then a lot of things were put together okay. and just kind of stayed together well, I will ask that question. Now, what year was the 75th birthday? And when did it take place? 1982. Okay. Ah, hold it up there. That's great. Okay, Cleveland State Bank, 75th. Okay, go right ahead, please. Charlie Bauer. I was just wondering, that's a two-story bank that they built back in 1907, I believe it was? 11. 11, 1911. And I was wondering what the upstairs of the building was used for bookkeeping, or was it just rented out as an apartment, or okay. if anybody would have any information on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is in regard to the 75-year anniversary, and maybe uh, we'll go a little closer. and. Do you, can you do it from the, that position to indicate who's who on this picture? Uh, Clarence Witte, Hertha Witte, Herb Lorfeld, and Cranston Heckman. Okay. And, uh, okay. Now that was uh, Mrs. Witte. Was she involved in yes. the bank also? Yes, she was. Oh, she was? Yes. Okay. And Mr. Witte and Mr. Lorfeld were both employees, and Mr. Heckman was on the board of directors. Okay. Okay, I believe this gentleman's name was uh, Cranston Eckman. Okay, and where did he live originally? He was not a resident of Cleveland, was he? Spring Valley. Spring Valley. Okay.
Okay, we have been shown some pictures from the past, and they are showing a lot of uh, gentlemen and women that uh, were uh, directors and guidance of the bank at Cleveland, and maybe there's a chance we can see what uh, they did for an occupation or a business, perhaps. Go right ahead, please. Uh, this is Charles Cole, past president of Cleveland State Bank. I'll begin by speaking uh, uh, of Cranston Heckman. Okay. Mr. Heckman joined the bank in 1934. He was elected to the board of directors. Okay. His occupation was a cheesemaker in the small community of Spring Valley. And he served on the board until 1990. Wow. He often remarked that in 1934, when he was elected to the board and became president of the board, he was elected because no one, t no one else would take the job because it was just after the Depression. Okay. And he did that tongue in cheek. <laughs> uh, Mr. Witte <coughs> served the bank for 50 years and he retired at the age of 65. So that would indicate that he did start wow. when he was 15 years old as a bookkeeper. He had, um, gone, he had gone to business college and then took over in, Ju in June of 1923 is when he joined the bank. And he later became the cashier and served as cashier of the bank up until his retirement. And he had served 50 years at that time, so that's quite an accomplishment. I would think. Mr. Lorfeld <coughs> joined the bank, I'm not exactly sure, but he, Mr. Lorfeld served as assistant cashier for 47 years and then continued on as a director. He had, up, he had been a board member and was a director up until the time of his death. Could, before we continue, could you uh, differentiate, if you will, a board and member and a director? What is there a difference? No, there is no real difference. No real difference. Okay. Um, <coughs> Hertha, when he worked with uh, the bank as the uh, teller bookkeeper, okay, and she worked already prior to my joining the bank in 1971, so I'm assuming she was there probably in the late 60s already. Uh, I started at the bank in 1971, and at that time they had three full-time employees, which was Mr. Witte and Mr. Lorfeld, and Mrs. Witte and Mrs. Mathias was part-time. And it was rather interesting to start off at the bank, because at that time, uh, things they didn't tell me when they hired me was that we would shovel the snow, we would mop the floors, we would cut the grass, and those were all extra activities that came about. So, so it was rather interesting. It was very interesting working with two people that had worked together for that many years because they just, they knew each other. One of them would walk out of the building and not even say where they were going and uh, that was just their nature. Mm -hmm. would, Mr. Witte would state, uh, do you know where Herb went? I says, I have no idea. But uh, come back in an hour or two. But that's the way they work together. Mm -hmm. Now as far as uh, your starting position, uh, it would, would be what? I started as uh, assistant cashier Okay. on a Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and they put me into the window, and I did not know anything about banking, balancing books, or anything else. And they were open from 8 until 12, but they changed the hours from 8 to 11, I believe, and blamed it on me. Because a good time to do it was when they hired a new employee, they cut their hours back. And I didn't get home until 1.30 that Saturday afternoon, because I didn't have my window balanced. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! <laughs> but I sort of wonder what I was really getting, into, got, what I had gotten <laughs> yeah, into. But it worked out very well, and I, uh, I worked with these gentlemen until Mr. Woodster, Mr. Whitty retired at 65. Mm -hmm. uh, then we had uh, Mr. Neil Parker came for a period of time in the early about 72 to 76. And after Mr. Parker left, then uh, I became uh, vice president and cashier and served in that position until I was elected president some years back. They must have saw something good in you, I'll tell you, you really moved along. 
had a rough start. <laughs> now, did uh, if I may ask, uh, kind of personal, maybe did you in, uh, inquire to work there, or did they contact you, or how did it all get started? Or was there a group of people that wanted a job like you had? Well, Mr. Witte, uh, I had I had been in the insurance business for eight years, and I was looking okay. to transfer to a different company, and I had used Mr. Witte as a reference. Mm -hmm. And I walked in one day to do my banking, and he uh, said he had gotten the inquiry and asked if I had ever uh, considered banking, because I actually my major was in uh, economics and finance. Okay. And I said no, and he asked if I would listen and uh, asked me to come to a board meeting, and I did, and he made an offer to me, and I thought it over and I accepted it. I had my doubts a year or two later, but <laughs> <coughs> things worked out quite well. Okay, very good. We originally started, the bank originally started just as a point of interest. Oh, I keep it going. When these shareholders originally started the bank, they capitalized the bank with $15,000. That was required. They had to bring that together. And if you were starting on a comparative basis, you were starting a new bank today in 2005, mm -hmm. the minimum requirement is $7 million in capital. Oh, man. And over the years, the uh, shares were increased. Uh, they went from 15 to 30,000. They, uh, they had stock split, and people were able to buy more shares. And today, they are capitalized with $90,000 in capital. And that's been sufficient because the reserves have been built up, and mm -hmm. the bank enjoys one of the higher capital ratios of any of the state banks in Wisconsin. They're running in excess of 13% capital ratio. And the state is running at around 96 now, capital bank. ratio, I'm uh, kind of ignorant about the accounting areas and banking. Uh, could you give us a yeah. little the basics capital, on that? It's the amount of capital that the bank has, which is basically the paid-in capital, the undivided profits, and the surplus. Those make up your total capital. Okay. And it's referred to as a capital-to-asset ratio. So the, we're about a $40 million bank right now. Wow. And uh, our capital structure is such that we have about a 13.5% capital ratio on the state average is around nine nine and a half to ten percent in that range okay. okay so the bank is very well capitalized uh, I have another personal question uh, you went to school somewhere to learn your capabilities uh, for the insurance area and well, I attend, yeah I attended four years at uh, University of Wisconsin Oshkosh okay and graduated in 1962 okay very good. and I'll go back further well, high school where did you go there I attended Q and Q High School for okay. four years. Okay, good. good. And before that, I had eight years, uh, four years with Woodland School up at School Hill. Okay. And four years at uh, Taylor School up on South Cleveland Road, good. which is now the residence of Carl and Carol Cole. Oh, really? Okay. Good. That was the school site. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, we got a, a young lady here, and uh, she'd like to say a few words about her relationship to the Cleveland State Bank. Go right ahead, please. I'm Marie Pippert, and I'm just looking at this. Now, the president was John Marple, that was, that was my uncle. And on this picture here is Clarence Whitty. He's married to Hertha Lutzig, and she was my first cousin. And, and her Marple, uh, was my first cousin, and then Cranston Heckman and his wife was my first cousin. <laughs> so they they were all related. <laughs> okay, I'm going to come over there, Marie, and you can point out to each person on the picture. If you would, oh, please. Just okay. one. Can you turn it and still see it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to come in on the picture. You go to town. This is Clarence Whitty. He's married to Hertha. She was Hertha Lutze. Okay. She, she's my first cousin. She's your first cousin. And Herbie Glorfeld, yes. Herbert Glorfeld. Yes. He's my first cousin. Okay. And Cranston Heckman was <laughs> married to. Uh, uh, Heckman, yeah. I had to think of her, Elsie Heckman. Okay. And she was my first cousin. And Hertha, and Herbert Glorfeld, and my sister. Yeah. They were all they were all first cousins, and they were all born within one week. Of each other. Oh I remember that they always said that. My gosh. Well, I thank you, Marie. Thank you very much for mm -hmm. that one.
Thank you. Okay, I've got a, yes, a young lady, and she'll you know, identify herself like she just did. Go right ahead, please. Cindy Hoon, Cleveland State Bank. Okay. In 1959. Okay. This building was built at 1150 West Washington Avenue. Okay. Um, it was built for approximate budget of $70,000. And I find it hard to believe, but they held their open house on Saturday, December 26th. Oh, really? From 2 to 5, and Sunday, December 27th, from 1 to 5. Whoa. And do you know any square footage and what was unique about that particular building compared to the old one? Yes. Okay, I can take a moment here. Yes, stop. Okay, I got a gentleman here who uh, can answer some questions pertaining to a, uh, I guess you'd call it a third bank, and second bank, huh? Okay, Charlie, go right ahead, please. <laughs> I'm Charles Cole, past president, and we're talking about the building that was built in 58 and 59. Okay. And this is located at 1150 West Washington Avenue. All right. The thing that was unique about this was the fact that they had a circular vault door in there. Ah, yes. Which which was quite a masterpiece. It was a 17 and a half ton unit. Oh, <clears throat> now that's the door? The door in the frame, yes. They purchased this as a used door out of a bank in Green Bay. And they bought it and stored it because they hadn't started their building project yet. Okay. It, it was truck down here in a flatbed truck, they had it coated in grease, a layer of grease so it wouldn't, because it's stainless steel so it wouldn't rust. And it was, when they built the building, it was built by uh, Hammond Construction. Okay. And they put the uh, wall door in, into that building. And then when the, we moved and built a new bank building in 1988, this building was then sold to a Lakeland Insurance Company. Yes. And they, at that time, elected to sell the door, and they had a construction crew come in, and they took out the entire door, laid it down on its face, took out the front windows of the existing of that existing building, and brought it out lying on its face, and then they trucked it, and it's now, I believe, located in a bank that was built in northwestern Wisconsin, okay. sold as a used door. So it never ended up at the final bank at this point. When we built the 1988 bank, the yeah. architect, the board really wanted to build, wanted to move the door. Okay. And the architect was very concerned about that. He said, because you'd be building the building around the door rather than building the building that you need. Oh. Because it, you needed some pretty high ceilings. Okay. You needed a terrifically strong support as far as the footings are concerned. Mm -hmm. And this old this uh, building that houses the village of Cleveland Town uh, Village Hall now, uh, the basement level there. If you ever walked in there, you could see the amount of concrete that supported that door. It was just immense. In fact, it was an identical concrete vault, size-wise, in the basement of that bank building with just a fire door on it. Really? It had massive walls. Wow. One of the big yes. changes was increasing the thickness of the concrete from 8 inches to 18 inches okay. because of the door. Oh my gosh. Now that door, to, s to swing it open, was it motorized in some fashion or did some person have to... It was no, leveled it very, very yeah. well. You can move this by hand? Yeah. Definitely. Wow. Yeah, at 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. It was a four o'clock door. <coughs> okay. You, you would uh, wind the four o'clocks, and three of them could fail, and you could still open up the door. And uh, you work uh, double combination. Double combination. And when you open the door, it, it would crank out the uh, <laughs> bolt, yeah. and then you pull, and she'd slowly move around. And you didn't want to get her going too fast, <laughs> or you'd hit. <laughs> she, she really gets close, it gets going. <laughs> or, or even as far as the catch on the other end, yes, you, you didn't yeah. want to have it hit that fast because yeah. there was a lot of weight on that door. Well, I'm sure when, was that door open when you were open for business? Was that door open also? Yes, it stood open. It was It was really a centerpiece I, of the building. I would say it was impressive to right. walk in there. I never was in there to see this. but uh, We used to have little children come in and they'd want to go and see where their money was because they always thought that their money was put on a pile and kept there. 
<laughs> and, we'd, and we'd walk them into the vault and uh, they'd always look around to see where their money was. But there was a small chest inside which kept the currency. Okay. Now that was a timed lock uh, with uh, electronics or electricity or no, mechanical? It was, it was mechanical. It was mechanical? Yeah. Okay. We had a service contract on it. It was serviced annually, and uh -huh. because it was stainless steel, it had to be wiped down. And anytime anyone touched it, you'd notice that because you'd have rusty fingerprints appearing on the uh, stainless uh -huh. steel. Uh -huh. well, the entire you. frame was stainless steel. Now, uh, going back to that bank, was that the bank that you worked in and yeah. started with? Yeah, I, oh. I started there in 1971. Okay. We did some remodeling in 1976 in the lobby, and then we did some more remodeling, I believe, in about 1980. Uh, we remodeled and did the entire basement level because we expanded and utilized the basement area. Okay. Uh, is there any documents uh, with the board of directors or anybody that this was a magnificent purchase of that vault again, which I'm referring to. There, there must have been a lot of discussion to bring that one in, uh, into that bank. Was there not? I don't believe so. Okay. I mean, they, they found out that that door was for sale and okay. the price was right. Yeah. I don't recall what they paid for it. Yeah. All. Very impressive. But I think after the after we sold the building to Lakeland, I think they sold the door for about five thousand dollars. Wow. Very good. <clears throat> today, I mean, if you look at our building that we're in now, that's just a small rectangular door, <laughs> and it's a much different vault as far as construction is concerned. It doesn't have the massive walls. It's got it's made of much more secure uh, material. Yeah. All right. And at that time, with that new bank, uh, was the employees increased as to the workload that was it maybe anticipated at that time? It eventually did. This bank was a, uh, so to speak, a multiple stockholder-owned bank. Uh, we had about 88 shareholders up until 1976, and at that time. Uh, <clears throat> the bank was made available for sale by some of the major shareholders. And there was an offer made on the bank, and many of the shareholders tendered their shares. And then the bank was sold to a Mr. Friedrichsen, and he was from Glenville, Minnesota, Fred Friedrichsen. And he bought that bank in 1976 and owned it for about two years, and then the Wisconsin Credit Union League at that time was prohibited from issuing checks or cashing checks, issuing share drafts. The clearing system didn't allow them to do that. So they were looking to purchase a bank and utilize a bank, which was authorized to do it, to clear their share drafts. And as a result of uh, Mr. Friedrichsen buying already, the number of shareholders went down from 88 probably down to about 20. And subsequent to that, uh, when the credit unions bought the bank from Mr. Friedrichsen in 1977, 1978, beginning of 78, um, then currently we, we have only about 12 shareholders because the uh, Wisconsin Credit Union League formed a one bank holding company, which is a separate corporation, and they capitalized that corporation with a million dollars and they bought the Cleveland State Bank. Mm -hmm. So now it's owned by Wisconsin. In essence, the majority of the shares are owned by Wisconsin Credit Unions, hmm. and it's referred to as Wiscub Incorporated as the... Uh, Could you say it one more time? Wiscub, W-I-S-C-U-B Incorporated, okay. Okay. which stands for Wisconsin Credit Union Bank. This was their, okay. their decision. All right. And we have worked with them since 1978, initially to provide share draft clearing, which we still do today. And uh, they st we still do that clearing for them, even though credit unions now can clear through their own routing numbers. Okay. They, can, they can act more and more as banks do. Okay. And I have to put this in, but they don't have to pay corporate income tax. Really? <coughs> that's correct. Oh, they pay no federal or state corporate income tax. That's a distinct advantage on that, especially when you look at our bank mm -hmm. and see the amount of 
the tax that we pay in a year's time. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm backing up probably a little bit here. The FDIC? Yes. When did that come into the picture? In the 30s. Yeah. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation came about after the Depression years. Okay. And the government elected then to form that corporation as an insurance corporation to insure the deposits of the American people. Okay. And originally, if you recall, I think the original insurance amount was like about $10,000. That's increased considerably now. Mm -hmm. 100000 plus to get another excess coverage for your individual retirement accounts. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and they've been talking about increasing that one more time. As far as maybe either one of you could handle this question, as far as services, when, say, you started into the business and uh, when you started in, uh, what has changed? Is it still pretty basic or has there been... The basic services are still there. I mean, we're deposit takers, we're loan makers. <clears throat> in essence, that we, I mean, we put the deposits to work. That people deposit, we turn around to lend out to uh, the public mm -hmm. on a margin. Okay. Yeah, excess funds that we have that we don't lend are placed in, in the investment portfolio so that we do have a return on those. Mm -hmm. Anything that changed, the biggest change as far as product offering is probably the automation that has taken place. Okay. The fact that we've gone from manually recording these things years back to uh, posting machines. Alice had a favorite the there. Posting in the machine. Yes, <laughs> posting, posting checks and transactions to customers' accounts, and we had a machine that was a real great machine, the E4000 Burroughs machine that Alice ran. Ah. And we sure hoped that it would, we would balance, right? Right, but that was way, that was way after this machine. I know. She had, a, she had one, that, uh, Burroughs before that, that was even more so. She ran, she ran all, they ran all the transactions, all the check transactions twice posted them twice, once to the customer's account, once to the bank's ledger, and wow. then they hoped that they balanced after they were through. Wow. And if not, they looked. I mean, today we have computers that do that, and if you sure. push the right keys, uh, yeah. you're pretty much able to maintain that. I mean, we have yeah. automated teller machines, and point of sale terminals, things are so much different. Yeah. Drive-up units. In okay, I gotta have. Yeah, so let's hear from you for a moment. In 1959, we did not have a drive-up. Oh, you did on this building. No. There was one installed in later years, but okay. uh, today, that's just a given that yeah. you would have that. Okay. And uh, your your recalls as to workloads and changes in your occupation there at the bank since you've been there. Can you recall some of those things that improved or some uh, things that have gone? awry? Well, most of them have improved. I mean, it's like any industry. There's uh, certainly a lot of good, and most of it relates to convenience for the customer, be it the drive-in okay. or using an ATM card or a debit card. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I mean, I've been there during the time where you would see 15% CD rates, and you mm. look back on some of the old information that we have here, and you're seeing 3% for CDs. You'd think that was today, mm -hmm. uh, but I also remember 15 or 13 percent mortgages, and you didn't have people buying homes at five and a half or six percent as mm -hmm. they do today. Mm -hmm. So, um, look at some of those things. Uh, internet banking, um, unfortunately, I think we do a lot of things to keep people out of our buildings, but also make it convenient for the customer. Uh, people do their banking at 10 o'clock at night instead of at one time they would come in during the day. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just a, a change in society and life. Okay. Very good, thank you. Mr. Go right ahead, sir. Charlie Bauer, I was just wondering, now the bank in 1911, did that have safety deposit boxes in? And if not, when did the safety deposit fad, when did that start? And is it still very popular today or did that kind of dwindle away? Okay, I got a young lady here who is uh, smiling this evening, and uh, she, I guess, was an employee. If she could start out with the years that she spent there and uh, yeah. what her job was. Go right ahead, please. Okay, I'm Alice Mathias. I started out at the bank 
uh, Kathy Wagner over here and I worked about, I think it was like two summers while they were on vacation. And what uh, years was this now? That was like in 60, 60, 63 maybe in that neighborhood, 64. Mm -hmm. Okay. And two summers we worked there and that was quite a challenge for us because neither of us ever did any type of banking work. And uh, it was fun. I remember when Hertha and I, when you saw that one picture with that posting machine, years, Charlie mentioned it, where you had to do that all by hand and balance out. And once in a month, I think it was like once every two weeks or something, that you had to add all those cards and they'd bring up an old machine from in the basement. It, they only had one uh, electric one, evidently, <laughs> and the other one, you had to stand and hold your feet so that it wouldn't move. And every check you, every number you added in, you had to pull the lever like this. Oh and it would always, gosh. Kathy, do you remember using that ever? Oh, yes. Yes. And uh, that was always quite a challenge. And then you had to always make sure that everything balanced. As far as safety deposit boxes, I don't know anything about it, the old, old bank, the 1910 one. But in the one that was built in 59, well, there were, of course, there were always safety boxes. There were, it seems like they used to sell for, five dollars and seven dollars and maybe ten dollars or something is that roughly what the prices were yeah they, they had three different sizes i know was mr colt your boss or who did you ask he was to? sort of my boss i guess right <laughs> 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 no he he was he wasn't my only boss because when i started clarence was my boss okay and then well, no, uh, clarence could you give his last clarence name witty okay and then when he retired, then it was Neil Parker. He was here like for six years, okay. I think. And then at, when Charlie started, then he was my boss right away, right? Yeah, because he was, yeah. We sort of, I sort of broke him in a little bit, I think, okay. too, on certain things. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, what else do you want me to say? <laughs> I guess you've answered I remember I one time, yes, too, right ahead, when Charlie said that it, they broke him on a Saturday morning, we had a young fella that they brought in just, uh, well, on the, they brought him in to help out on when it was Kohler Patey and things, yeah. and he got to the window at 3 o'clock, say, like, and there were so many people, and he didn't know what end was up because he never was broke in. Oh. And uh, we had a heck of a time balancing that night too, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was always a challenge balancing out at night. Very, that's always the problem. Right. right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got a young lady here who would like to identify herself and uh, tell us uh, something that she's looking at. I'm Marie Pippert. I'm just looking through this book, Statement of Expense. First thing I ever knew that my dad had a taxi service. It says on the 26th of April, 1924, Albert Lutze, taxi service, $5, and he's in your cup at times, $2, $1. Never knew he had a taxi service. <laughs> I knew he had a garage, but I didn't know he had a taxi service. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you, Marie. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Well, I just helped at, oh, Kathy Wagner. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just helped out at the bank a couple of summers. Okay. And then Mr. Lorfield did come and ask me if I wanted a full-time job. Okay. And then I was going to be the village clerk, so I didn't have time to be. Or I already was the village clerk, so I didn't have time to be. Uh, okay. To have another job. Plus, yeah. I had children I had to worry about at home. Now, the village clerk, uh, you worked with the bank quite a bit at that time because well, of. Well, I took a lot of money to the bank. A lot of money to the bank, huh? <laughs> I collected taxes and okay. I collected sewer and water bills. Okay. Okay. She took it all for school. <laughs> you never gave me anything. I always brought it. <laughs> they needed a new sewer pipe down the street, huh? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. I remember that yes. posting, though. You do? Can you give us that a little yes, bit? I posted, you know, and then we posted once, and then you posted again, and then maybe something wasn't quite in alphabetical order, so then I turned it around and did it in another line, and then when we were trying to balance out that was a real picnic <laughs> now there's balancing because out because the the things didn't jive anymore oh that's right they would print on top yeah, of each other yeah yeah, oh. yeah 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 now is so, this a i felt sorry for mr lorfeld here and there <laughs> <laughs> now is this a, a thing with a bank as far as a regulation that at the end of the day everything must balance out 
That's my understanding. Okay. Very good. We didn't go home until we balanced out. Until you balanced out. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we got a lady who raised her hand and she's got something to say. Go right ahead, please. I'm Alice Mathias. Uh, like Kathy said, at the end of the day, we all had to balance out our windows. Yeah. And a lot of, at the earlier times, the bank would close like at 8 o'clock on a Friday night. We'd balance oh, out after that. I see. Now, before I quit working, we'd balance out already like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then uh, one by one, they'd balance out their windows. And then after that, you'd be into the next day's work. Mm -hmm. But there was also a job that you had to do on the end of balancing. Each one window would get balanced out. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time, it was my job to get all these accounts together every window and mm -hmm. then you have to come up with figures and mm -hmm. that would all have to balance out okay. and your cash would have to balance out so you were doing this balancing on the fly as they were processing well we no. didn't process see then we sent everything away by oh, courier the guy oh. had to come maybe like at nine o'clock at night and once in a while we wouldn't be quite ready for him because okay. we were still trying to figure balance out the bank because it had to be balanced out every night before you sent Okay, where did this go then, this information? It went to Milwaukee. Oh, okay. Years back it was first Wisconsin, right? And then after that, M and I took over. Okay. So. Okay, very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good, hand on this. Okay, when there's a new bank that's going to be built, uh, there's apparently some reasons for that. And uh, usually it's need of room or size or more capability. And maybe uh, Mr. Culp can indicate what the reasons were for the new bank. <clears throat> we decided in uh, 1987 to proceed with a new bank building primarily because of the number of people that we had working in the share draft department. Uh, the share draft department is a draft clearing that we did for the Wisconsin Credit Unions. We had previously remodeled the lower level of our existing building at 1150 West Washington, mm -hmm. and we were running out of room there. And we had the choice of either remodeling that building and adding on, but we were limited by space requirements because of the location. Mm -hmm. So we had already previously purchased the lot up across from the church and we made a decision then to go ahead and uh, build a new facility. And the new facility had about 9,600 square feet. The old one <clears throat> with the addition would have cost us about a half a million dollars to do the remodeling. And we built this one here and furnished it for around $650,000. If you want a comparative analysis, we're putting up 4,250 square feet in our new branch in Howard's Grove, and our uh, bids are in at about a million. Mm. That was built in 1988, and now we're doing this in 2005. So that gives you an idea of what uh, building costs have increased. Mm -hmm. And uh, the newest uh, things that were added, and I'll maybe go over to this young lady. Uh, I believe drive-ins and uh, other customer conveniences, perhaps? Um, the previous building that was built in 1959, a drive-in window had been added through the years. Okay. I really don't remember exactly when that was. Um, of course, when the new building was built in 1988, it does have uh, two drive-up lanes, which are used very, very frequently. Uh, our new facility in Howard's Grove will also have two drive-up lanes. 
could, handed. Could you give us the location of that lo uh, bank in Howard School, please? Um, we broke ground about approximately two weeks ago, okay. and it will be located at 502 South Wisconsin Drive in Howard's Grove. Is that in the middle of the village? Or Pretty much the, so. Okay. Yes. Yes, that it is. Um, and we'll have a third lane for uh, ATM machine for cash access. Okay. So that'll work, uh, work very nicely. Yes. Now, Here, our, somebody even oh, okay. brought our recent groundbreaking. Okay. Can you name all the people on the picture? On this one, yes. Okay, <laughs> I'll uh, cut right here and we'll see if you can get it in a position so you can read them. Go right ahead and uh, name those uh, people that are on there, please. Present are Beth Munich, Assistant Cashier, Joe Lipom, our State Senator, Attorney Mark Wirtz on our Board of Directors, uh, village president of Howard's Grove, Ken DeZombre, uh, Joel from uh, Hammond and Associates, he's the foreman on our project, mm -hmm. uh, president of the bank, uh, Tim Schuler, mm -hmm. um, assistant vice president, Al Kramer, assistant vice president, Matt Harms from Cleveland State Bank, our contractor, Steve Hammond, uh, village clerk, Mary Zor from uh, Howard's Grove, uh, Director Charles Kolb, Director Dennis Stuckman, our engineer Steve Peterman with Torquey Worth Pajera. Um, Steve Cassell, Castell, uh, okay. state representative. Mm -hmm. Colleen Minster will be our branch manager at the Howard's Grove office and myself. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. Are they going to be moving some people from this location uh, to that location to get them started, or is that uh, any kind of game plan there? We currently have. Uh, Mid-May, we opened a temporary office in the former Village Hall in Howard's Grove oh, at really? oh. uh, 1311 Millersville Avenue. Um, Matt okay. Harms and Colleen Minster have... Uh, left our main office and went to the temporary office and they will then be moving into the new branch and we've hired uh, some additional people okay also all right now you're still a director mr cole yes i am and uh as far as the owners of this new bank it's uh, the same person or is it still one person or is there more stockholders no it's present the same ownership the only thing that we did was applied for a branch in the Okay. Of Howard's Grove. Okay. Do you Wisconsin allows that under the branching laws. Okay. You saw a need for a, a bank to be in that uh, village? We uh, felt we saw an opportunity because of the sale of the Howard's Grove Bank, which had been a small independent bank, oh. and then was sold and purchased by National Exchange Bank out of Fond du Lac, which is a large bank. Okay. All right. Okay. Will you be offering uh, better or different services than the present one that's there? We'll offer competitive services to them. Okay. <clears throat> we, um, we are looking to put a stronger emphasis on agricultural lending that we are okay. doing, and commercial lending. Okay. You brought up a good point or subject, I guess, uh, agricultural lending. Uh, I imagine you can remember in the older days when farmers came in for a loan for a piece of equipment or land or whatever, uh, cattle. Uh, what uh, do you recall that to be as far as amounts, uh, amounts that people really needed at that time? They were small compared to today's standards. Um, <laughs> you talked uh, land purchase in the neighborhood of it could be anywhere from 200 to 400 dollars an acre depending on the time at that time. Mm -hmm. Today you're seeing farmland being offers being made up to 3,000 dollars an acre. Oh man. It's, uh, Considerably different. Same thing with automobiles. You used to finance automobiles at at purchase price was twenty four hundred dollars, and today they're quite difficult to find one around twenty four thousand. So wow, everything has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as homes, uh, anything has changed there that uh, young people now are getting rates. Uh, do you compete with that kind of rates, or does that go to someplace else? No, we uh, well the market uh, mortgage market is considerably different today. 
<clears throat> years back uh, when institutions made a mortgage loan, they would retain the ownership of that loan in their in-house. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, with Fannie Mae and Federal Land, yeah, everybody, Federal Home Loan Bank, and, uh, the loans are made and then they are sold and many times the servicing rights are retained. And uh, <coughs> as a result, you make the loan, you sell the loan, you get your money back, you make the loan again and sell it again, you just keep using the dollars over and over. Or previously, you had booked the loan, and then you had that fifty thousand dollar house out there for the twenty years that the mortgage yes. ran. Yes. So things are a lot different. And then when they're sold into the uh, secondary market, then they are packaged and they're again resold in the bond market. And uh, <coughs> financial institutions invest in mortgage-backed securities and uh, make money doing that. Now. Do they handle uh, like a home, uh, single homeowner versus a duplex? Is there any difference in the way this loan is handled for that situation? Not too much difference other than the titling of it. Some of them are uh, titled under the condominium laws, which are somewhat different than direct ownership. Mm -hmm. And you have condominium association agreements. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't have a bearing on how you lend. Okay. As far as, again, farmers uh, buying equipment, uh, that has got to be skyrocketing too? It has. I mean, tractors that used to be five, six thousand dollars today, they're a hundred thousand dollars or more. The equipment is, it's, a, it's, it's rather unbelievable as to how the price increases, mm -hmm. but it's true with the home ownership also. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of a loaded question. When things don't go right after you've made a loan and the person cannot make the payments. Uh, what type of maneuvers take place? My uh, boss, Mr. Friedrichsen, at the time said you make every loan as if it's going to go bad, mm. <clears throat> which means you do some really good underwriting at the time you put the loan on the books. And then I basically try to work with your customer. I mean, if there's a difficulty, many times it's illness, once in a while it's financial, once in a while it's poor management. Mm -hmm. But you do try and work with that customer to try and let him achieve his goals mm -hmm. or her, and uh, sell them that we have to take any action. There's a lot of concern being shown right now by our Mr. Greenspan as far as the interest only loans that are being used today. Uh, okay. <clears throat> That's that alone where instead of starting making your principal and interest payment immediately, mm -hmm. you defer that and pay interest only or a portion of the interest only. Wow. And uh, with the hopes that the real estate value will increase and you can later on afford it and you'll get that raise. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of speculation in that and he has a lot of concern about that. Mm -hmm. Recent figures show that the interest only loans in the year 2004 increased 25% over previous, the previous year and that's rather dramatic. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's risk involved mm -hmm. and he's making that known in his speeches lately. So to put out the beware sign there. Correct. Uh, there was a time in my recall with farmers of years back that they'd go to the bank for a, say they needed a new tractor, I'll start with that, and uh, the bank says, well, we wouldn't, we don't want to really lend you the money for just the tractor, but if you'd buy an extra 200 acres of land and maybe add a piece of equipment to that tractor, Rather than loaning you, uh, say, seventy-five thousand, we'll loan you four hundred thousand. Is that a factor? Or was that a loan out of proportion situation? I don't think it was true at our bank, <clears throat> but I think it has been true in, in some instances. But again, if you're underwriting a farm loan, there are times where you have an unbalanced situation as far as the amount of acres that the farmer may own. Mm -hmm and the equipment that he's buying, and there's usually ratios that we look at as far as the capital investment mm -hmm. in equipment versus the number of acres and number of cows. So uh, sometimes you have to help him and work through the management situation and suggest increasing the number of cattle he's milking so he has a, okay. a better milk flow, more, better cash flow, mm -hmm. and the same thing holds true as far as uh, the land mm -hmm. situation. And so then once a while there are opportunities there for the farmer to expand too, that's mm -hmm. part, if that's part of his plan. Right, 
The agricultural picture today is much, much different. I mean, we don't have that average of 60 cow herd anymore. I mean, that's been increased considerably. I mean, we have large farms, mega farms, as, you, as they refer to them. Is there an insurance policy that the bank offers when you make a loan that it's not you caught with the with the problem, or uh, there's a, another backup system? Yeah, you can get guaranteed loans uh, through some of the government programs, and you are. Uh, you can book the loan and then get an 80% or 90% guarantee on some of these loans. That is true. Okay. I imagine the person that borrows the money pays the premium for that situation. Yeah. yeah. Naturally, as the borrower, you pay the cost. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. Is uh, the new bank going for Howard's Grove for a moment? In size, does it compare to the one you have here at Cleveland, or is it As small? far as the physical building? Yes. It'll be about half the size. Half the size. Okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much. And anything you'd like to add, ma'am? Probably the thing that I would like to add is who our current board of directors are. Yes. Um, we have uh, Lyman Klein, who is with um, a representative from WISCUB. He lives in Schofield. Okay. Charles Kolb, who's been a uh, director since 1974. Alan Krupt has been a director since 1993. Mm -hmm. Tim Schuler, president of the board, had been elected to our board of directors in 1999. Dennis Stuckman had been elected to our board in 2000, and attorney Mark Wirtz in 1983. So we have a lot of years of experience on our board and uh, mm -hmm. certainly okay. there to give good direction. Okay. Very good. Is it a cross uh, representation, if you will, of farming, of uh, industry or uh, business? Yes, yes, that it definitely is. Uh, Attorney Wirtz, uh, you know, representing the professional field. Uh, Dennis Stuckman is a home contractor, so he certainly knows prices and things that are out there, and uh, just as far as running a business. Mm -hmm. Alan Krupt is an owner-operator of K&K &K Jersey, a large dairy farm in town of Centerville. Um, Charlie is uh, the retired banker, so yeah, we have a very good, very good cross-reference of uh, our community mm -hmm. and our area. Okay. So I think that's very, very positive. Uh, you've got a loaded question. Uh, has there ever been in women on the board of directors? No. Is that is there something with the bank uh, that they don't <laughs> like that, or is there <laughs> is there some opportunity for yourself, perhaps? <laughs> I won't comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, any comment on that one? <laughs> Not really at this point. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Ed, sir. I'm Gordon Mathias. I'd like to know uh, when you start your new bank in Howard's Grove, will they have, will that be run by the board of directors of the village of, of the Cleveland State Bank, or will they have their own board of directors? over there to run the bank. Okay, thank you. Very good, Lord. Okay, we have a question on the floor, and this gentleman will identify himself and give us some information, please. Charles Cole, past president of the Cleveland State Bank. Uh, the question regards uh, separate board of directors for the branch of Howard's Grove. Corporate-wise, it hasn't changed any structure at all. The <coughs> Cleveland State Bank, in its corporate structure, simply built a physical facility in Howard's Grove as a branch and it's operating as the Cleveland State Bank or Howard's Grove. Is that the new uh, logo? <laughs> Correct. Okay. The new logo, I mean, we've changed that. Okay. And basically, okay. it's the same board of directors that made the decision to build over there and branch over there, and it will govern that. Mm -hmm. We did have some discussion of a possible advisory board from that community. Okay. That hasn't been determined really yet at this point. Very good. We have a question on the floor here. Go right ahead, please. Charlie Bauer from Newton. Um, I know our Newton State Bank was robbed at one time, and I was just wondering whether or not the Cleveland ever have any activity like that take place in, in the village here. Good question, Charlie. <laughs> okay, we have a young lady again. Uh, she's uh, going to answer a question on the floor. Go right ahead. Um, Mr. Bauer had asked about any bank robberies, and uh, Mr. Witte had commented in this article where it said, Clarence Witte probably scared some Southside Chicago 
hoodlums out of committing a few bank robberies around here back in 1932 when he was deputized to organize a vigilante committee. Witte, then in his ninth year as cashier at the Cleveland State Bank, joined sidekick Herb Lorfeld in response to a late evening advance warning calls from the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. The pair, armed with a shotgun and rifle, cruised around in their car till daybreak to foil what developed into a checkpoint preventive measure for the break-in suspected of the Windy City mob squad. We didn't find any bank robbers, but there were other strange things looking out there, Witty recalled, of the 10-mile radius they covered. Every car with two or more persons seemed suspicious. The Great Depression remained, but the vigilantes, like the good old West, was to be discontinued by the County Bankers Association in 1936. So Cleveland State Bank has never been robbed. Never been robbed. Correct. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. That's good news. <laughs> okay, we have a young lady who wants to uh, indicate some information by identifying herself first. I'm Alice Mathias, and one morning about 8 o'clock, I think just about the time when the bank was going to open, I answered the telephone ring and I answered it, and they said, what did they say? I don't even remember. I think they said there was a bomb planted in the building. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. oh. And we had to... We had some very anxious moments. I was scared stiff. <laughs> we all we stood out in the parking lot by the telephone company, which is next door, uh -huh. and uh, the police officers came. They had the street barricaded off, didn't they, and everything else? And uh, it was quite a scare. And when did that happen again? I, oh, I would say probably in 85. No kidding. Anybody know? Okay, no. Uh, that was the only time we ever had anything all the years I worked. But then one lighter moment, we always, I don't know if we should say we enjoyed it, but on a Friday afternoon, years back, the Cleveland Co-op uh, hired a lot of Mexican workers. Okay. And they would come in to cash their checks, say probably during the noon hour. And there were probably 20 in, at the bank at one time in the lobby, and that's all that cutch, cutch, cutching, yeah. you know. <laughs> but they always came with an interpreter. Oh. And most of the time what they came in for was to cash their check, and they, most of the time we had four or five money orders each one wanted to be sent home for whatever reasons. And uh, we were very, very glad when they when that day was over when they had pity because it was really, really it was that. hard because you couldn't understand them and they had to write everything out and oh, whatever. So that was always an interesting. Kathy, did you ever go through that? No. I no? Never went okay. That. Okay. She <laughs> left out. That was the canning factory? Yeah, there's Cleveland Canning Company. Oh, yeah. Canning factory. Sure. I remember those days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. We got a gentleman here who raised his hand and he's got a thought to share with us. Go right ahead, please. I'm Charles Cole, past president of the bank, and I'm related to Marie Pepper, who is sitting across the table from me. Okay. At times, I would go into work early <laughs> when we were at 1150 West Washington Avenue, and my office was to the rear of the building. Mm -hmm. And Marie had this habit of getting out on her bicycle early in the morning and riding around the backside of the building. And she saw that my car was at the back of the building, and she stopped next to my office window and I had my back to the window and she rapped on the window and I'm sure she took 10 years off of my life. <laughs> I'll never live as long as Marie. <laughs> I remember that. I imagine when you're in deep thought and you're this rapping comes out the window, it's got to be a shock. <laughs> and then when she saw that I really did a good move, you know, and she <laughs> laughed and rode off. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays they'd call that harassment, wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Look how good I am today. <laughs> Debatable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sure, yes. Thank you. Okay, we have a young lady here who would uh, like to read a little bit of an uh, article, and she'd like to identify herself, please. Okay, Kathy Wagner. This is in the 75 years of change. It says, Mr. Witte continued that we didn't ever get any plumbing in that place. Ever hear of the James Whitcomb Riley, he asked? That's what we called it because of a poem of Riley's about the place out in back. Well, we had to go out and use the James Whitcomb Riley. And if we wanted coffee or water during the day, we had to bring it in in a thermos or something. I think this is interesting, too. The bank, which, which 
at this time employed 15 people was a two-person operation for a number of years wow. with both Lorfeld and Witty doing computations by hand. We did the checking account posting by hand and Herb computed the interest on saving the accounts by hand. And I think what's real interesting is that when they moved to the, to the, new, to the second building, Mrs. Witty, who worked as a bookkeeper at the bank from 1958 until 1973, remembered going from the adding machine to the posting machine as the need arose until the present building was constructed and the newest labor saving machines were purchased. In the old days, the group recalled there was one adding machine and two people. Herb said he had a typewriter at home, which he brought down. And then Hertha said, Hertha Witty said, I'm the only fixture they moved. <laughs> very good, very good, thank you. Okay, got a young lady who's pointing out something that she'd like to add uh, mm -hmm. to what was indicated. Go right ahead, please. Okay, I'm Mary Pippert. In the book of expenses, there were three women that must have been doing some work there. One was Mrs. Oscar Lutzig, was that she was my aunt, and, and Mrs. Reiner that said, and Mrs. Barr, and then behind their names they said scrub. Every one of them had said scrub. It must have been what they did. It was a dollar and a half. Dollar and a half. Dollar and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Reinert was uh, the wife of the doctor in Cleveland. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, we got a lady here who raised her hand. She's got something to offer. Go right ahead, please. Hi, I'm Alice Mathias. I don't have anything to offer, but I got a question to ask. Years back, when these first directors were named, are they local people? Like that, some of the, that Beerman guy and that those, no. that other name. There was there were such unfamiliar mm -hmm. names. I wondered about that. Schneider was familiar. Mm -hmm. They probably. Was his first, um, okay. Okay. Uh, we have uh, some questions, I guess, that came from the floor in regard to some uh, directors, if they were local and that type of thing. And uh, this lady can identify herself and give us information. Uh, Cindy Hoon, Cleveland State Bank, on September twenty eighth of nineteen oh seven. Uh, here it said it was further resolved and accepted that Fred A. Brandlow of Teresa, Wisconsin shall be acting bookkeeper for one year at $40 a month and begin his term on Monday, September 30th of 1907. So he came in from Teresa, or Teresa Wisconsin. And later but on he was one of the directors then, right? Wasn't his name? Um, I don't think, not this Brandlow. Oh. That he was not, but otherwise, you know, these are names that have Never reappeared. Heard. Yeah, all of a sudden you hear Plastic Wall in the mm -hmm. Laurel and stuff. But those other names, person wonders. There is a know. list that's going around of all the uh, people who have served as directors of the bank. Mm -hmm. And I know some of those names were certainly there, but I, I don't know beyond that. But I don't. Very good, thank you. Okay, i got a gentleman here who's been uh, taking someone's place this evening, and he'd like to do the normal recap of, of the evening. Go right ahead, please. Charlie Bauer. I'm sitting in for Kathy Sixel, who's away from her duties tonight. <laughs> and we had a wonderful discussion tonight with the Cleveland State Bank, and I want to thank Cindy Hoon and Charlie Cole for coming and talking to us tonight. And uh, we enjoy the information, and you're welcome to join us at any time. We meet once a month, and our next meeting will be November 14th, and Kathy didn't give us the topic, but we always get mailed out a postcard, and then the topic's on there, and then if you have any information or pictures, just bring them, and everybody's welcome to discuss what we talk about. And as a side that, I don't know if you all know it or not, but next month will be five years, or fifth year anniversary of meeting as a group here in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And I think that's about all I have to say. Okay. Very good. And this evening, I'll just, uh, Go to the people and uh, have them give their name, and we'll call it an evening, okay? Charlie, I'll start with you one more time. My name? Yes, sir. It's Charlie, <laughs> Charlie Bauer from Luton. <laughs> okay, that's good. Thank you. Here we got a young lady who participated this evening. We appreciate it. Go right ahead, please. What do you want to know? I just want to know your name. <laughs> oh, Marie Pippert. <laughs> and where do you live? I'll throw that in there, too. Still in Cleveland. Still in Cleveland. Very good. And who do you have here, please? 
<laughs> Kathy Wagner, and I'm still in Cleveland. You're still in Cleveland? Good. And who do you have here, please? Walter Chris, East Washington. And that's where? In, in Haika or Cleveland? Haika, uh, formerly Haika. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. And we'll pan over here very slowly, and we'll have this young lady who did a marvelous job this evening. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Cindy Hoon, Cleveland State Bank. I reside at 1481 Lakeshore Drive in Cleveland, and I just want to thank this group for uh, keeping up the history of the community. I think it's really important, and for asking Cleveland State Bank to be a part of it tonight. Well, we thank, thank you, you also. Very good. Thank you. And we have a gentleman here who provided a lot of information for us, and he'd like to identify himself also. Charlie Cole, past president of the Cleveland State Bank, living at Newton. And I also want to extend my thanks to you as a group here for inviting us down and letting us share information with you. Very good. Thank you for keeping up that information. That was a great job. And who do you have here, please? Melvin Yiddish. Uh, I live in Cleveland. I figure I'm living here all my life. Good. <laughs> good job. <laughs> and who do you have here, please? Ken Bruxton from Cleveland. Okay. Thank you, Ken, for coming this evening. We appreciate it. Judy Bruxton from Cleveland. And Judy, thank you for coming with your husband. You're welcome. <laughs> and we have another lady here, please. Hi, I'm Alice Mathias. It was nice to renew some old pictures and thoughts. Very good. Yes, and we appreciate your input also. And we have a gentleman here, please. I'm Willard Mathias from 1018 Juniper Street. Thank you very much. And who do you have here, please? Irene Nine, new address as of June 13th. Wonderful. Where was that? Is that a? Could you give us that address? Still 915 Polk Lane, Cleveland. Okay. Okay. Again, I want to offer my thanks to. All those that participated this evening, we appreciate it. And as in Charlie Bauer indicated, we're having another meeting coming in one month from now approximately, and we'd like everybody to attend. And as uh, Charlie indicated, Kathy usually will send out the necessary postcards if she knows you're interested and has your address. Thank you very much, folks. this evening we appreciate it and as Charlie Bauer indicated we're having another meeting coming in one